Okay. Um, and then we can, I, th I also wanted to make sure that they could start typing into the chat. So I thought Aubrey could help us with that. Yeah, sure. And the chat is live and open right now. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so there's probably like a 30 second lag on there. Um, but it's yeah. up right now and I see it. I have another computer here that I'm monitoring it with, so. Perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. So there's probably like a third. There we go. That's working. The stream is Gucci. And I have one of the recruiters. So if we don't have everyone, I'll probably start. I don't want Chad to sit in the waiting room for too long. So I might let him in in five. And we can just. Um, kind of judge with him until everyone else joins. And Margaret, do you have um, the stream up? Can you see it? Yes. Awesome. And I saw Aubrey did like a, she can hear us on the stream. It looks like it's all working. Oh, good. Oh, great. Sorry I couldn't make the uh, stream test, guys. Oh, no, you're good. And Eric, thank you again. No problem. Real amazing thing you're doing here. <laughs> Um, yeah. This is all new stuff for me, kind of, too. So it's nice to play around and have fun with it. So Yeah, yeah. And it really does help streamline with focus groups, too, to be able to do all of the moderating and running that on our own. So Yeah, and as we get used to this, it's honestly super easy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shoot. Someone was in the room and then left. That picture. Uh, can I have permission to record also so I can do that backup one? Yes. Okay, then we're going to have three. So, because Fabi's recording right now. Okay, Fabi's doing one too. Yeah, yeah I am recording. So, if, okay, Fabi, if you're yeah. doing it, we could just use that one. We don't need to know. Because okay, I'm recording it on my end too, just on this um, streaming software that I'm using. Okay. And then we'll have yours as a backup. I think that should be fine. Perfect. Yeah, one backup is really great. That also cuts down on storage that's going to interrupt with our VJ account. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to let these participants in in two minutes, just because we lost one person and I'm a little worried that they didn't want to wait. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let chat in guys, just cause I don't, I've seen a couple of people start and then go away and I just want to make sure they come in. So I'm going to let and Tom to just sit tight as we're waiting for everyone else to join.
Hey there, I'm Fabi. Um, welcome to the focus group. I am just going to, uh, we're waiting for a few more people to join. So I'm just gonna have you guys hang out on mute. Um, I think Chad is still joining the um, audio, but yeah, I'm gonna have you guys hang out on mute. And once we hit the top of the hour, if you guys would be open to turning on your video, would love to just all be able to see each other as we chat, but no need to yet. Did you order something? Maybe I ordered something from Amazon. It's probably what it is. Hello? Hey, Chad. We are just gathering everyone right now, waiting for a few people to join. We're waiting on, I think, three more. Um, so we'll just kind of, if you want to just hang out on mute until seven, we'll get going then. Okay. Thank you. Just open that new one too, so I'm glad I had. I like that in that stream. In case something bad happens. So bad. <laughs> Honestly, I don't really have anything to do. Um, Aubrey says that it's up and it's perfect, so. Not yet. Oh, wait for the start. But it's live, so. I don't think that they can hear me. It's loud. I think there's a mechanism on there. No, they can't.
Fabi, and this is Margaret here. Um, you'll also see this administrator box in here. Um, really, Margaret and I work for uh, Vladimir Jones. It's an ad agency and research firm here in Colorado. And we go around the country, we talk to different people about all manner of topics, tourism, cars, dental careers like we are today. You name it, we've we've talked about it. And, um, and so today we're talking about dentistry. We have our administrator here and we are recording this session because we do have some members of our team serving, but they're not going to be part of the conversation. So I don't know if you've ever seen like commercials where people are in a room and there's a two-way mirror. This is sort of the virtual version of that. Um, so the administrator is just here to kind of help stream what we're talking about to our virtual back room here. Um, and it's mostly just people trying to pay attention. And the reason that we're recording this as well is it's really important to have you tell us a lot about an industry we aren't very familiar with. And the best way to remember what you told us is to be able to put it into a transcript and get quotes. Um, I always like to say this is not your YouTube debut. It's not going, your likeness will be nowhere. Um, this is really just for us to share back with the team members that we have and our clients a little bit about what you told us. And nothing is better to hear it than directly from your voices. So that's the administrator bubble. I'm Fabi. Margaret is here in the glasses as well, and she'll be chiming in too. Um, and, and like I said, I think the important thing to remember is that you guys are our subject matter experts tonight. We don't know really anything about dentistry. The little I know is what happens when I see my dentist twice a year and she tells me what's going on with my mouth. And I know next to nothing of the process in going from dentistry school into a career in dentistry. Um, so we have a lot to get through. I wanna try and keep this to about 75 minutes with all of us. Oh, and now we have someone just joining us, Roz. Um, I won't delay though, we'll keep going. But I, I wanna hear from all of you. So don't be offended if this is gonna be very conversational, really fun, and honestly something you guys know a lot about. But don't be offended if I quickly change topics or I cut you off and move on. Um, it's really just so that we're not sitting here talking about the same thing for forever. Um, so yeah, that's just all the business. Roz, welcome. Um, Hi, how are you? Good, good. My name is Fabi and Margaret here in the glasses is also part of the Vladimir Jones team. We were just giving a little bit of our spiel about what we're doing here today. We're meant to talk a little bit about the topic of dentistry and going from dental school into dental careers. We're gonna talk a little bit about certain brands and, and specifically about one company today, but the point is to really get a broad understanding of what your world is like. Um, Margaret and I don't have any agenda here. I, I often say we don't get fired if you don't like something or promoted if you do. Uh, you're really here to tell us everything and your honest opinion. And you guys might not agree with one another and that's okay too. I think we always try to maintain some respect, but really open to discourse and dialogue. And we should be out of here in probably hour, hour and 15. Recording in progress. Um, at AT Still at the Mesa campus. And currently I'm in Maryland doing my uh, second external rotation at one of a community health center out here. What got me into dentistry uh, was honestly my dad. He was a dentist. And I, growing up, I never wanted to be a dentist because of him. Um, didn't think that that was something that I wanted to do, but after going to college and then realizing that my initial plan wasn't really what I wanted to do, uh, he made me, uh, go and shadow an orthodontist and I got to learn how to place brackets and really get the patient interaction and found out that I 
loved that aspect rather than sitting in a lab all day. And I got to help people change their smiles. So it worked out. Love that. So, and maybe just a quick show of hands. I know Jordan said he's still in school. If you are still in school, do you mind just raising your hand versus who has graduated already? Okay, Morgan, Celia, and Jordan. And Janice, I guess if you are, chime in. <laughs> yeah, I already graduated. Okay, cool. So a nice mix where some of you are still in school and some of you have graduated. Um, Jordan, Morgan gave us a very similar story of a, a parent in dentistry that made her not want to pursue it, but got pulled in anyway. One thing I've heard a few of you mention is lifestyle. What is it about dentistry as a lifestyle that feels different from other career paths, perhaps medicine. It seemed like some of you guys opted for dentistry over medicine. And anyone can chime in at this point. You don't have to take much home. Um, you can finish a lot of your notes while you're in the practice. You don't have to really come home, review a lot of patient charts afterwards. That, that was a, a really good thing about dentistry. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Genesis. I think that the time management is really good because once you're done, you're pretty much done. And um, in dentistry, the, there's so much more you can like diagnose. In medicine, there's so many unknowns, but dentistry is a little bit more straightforward. So you feel kind of more accomplished and fulfilled. Is fulfillment important to you guys? What, what does fulfillment mean to you? What does that look like? being satisfied with what you can accomplish and feeling like what you're doing is meaningful. I think at least for me, it's the instant gratification of either doing a filling or uh, doing same day crowns um, and seeing how the patients can change from literally just an hour of your time with them. That's what I personally enjoy the most. Yeah. So I agree with you. You can make a big impact quickly. Yep. Okay. Celia, I saw you nodding to some of what Morgan said and some of what Jordan said. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm still in school and I'm doing a lot of um, classwork still, but I have just started to see some patients and um, I actually really haven't gotten to do too much yet, but so far, like some of the patients have broken down in my chair about their smile and just the fact that I will be able to like help them gain that self-confidence back and that um, that idea that, you know, they're taking care of their bodies despite what else is going on in their life. It's like a big deal. So, yeah. Cool. At least um, from a lot of my friends that went into medicine, um, a lot of the stuff that they're doing besides the fact the general surgeons that I know is that their patient care is going to be lifelong, whether that's keeping them on medications or doing something along those lines where they're treating them constantly for the rest of their life and just maintaining what they have. And even though that's what we'll be doing too, uh, we get to see some of that change um, with our own hands rather than just prescribing different medications. Yeah. I'm getting a sense that there's something about the tactile aspect. It's hands-on work comparatively to other forms of medicine. Why does that matter? I feel like, uh, excuse me, on top of that, it's also the ability to interact with other people. The fact that you get to go to work, interact, talk to people, talk to kids, talk to them about different aspects of life. There's a lot of downtime in dentistry also, especially in dental school. Um, so I think it's the ability to, to be active with our hands as well as be able to interact with others. Yeah, that's cool. I like that idea of interacting with others. And I know, I know, um, Chad, of course you had the focus of wanting to interact specifically with children, pediatric dentistry. When you guys think of interacting with patients, whether that's currently or down the line, what do you envision? What is that interaction like? helping them. It's like a interaction where, you know, they're coming to you with a problem and you're able to offer them a solution that's not, you know, super invasive. Hopefully it doesn't take a whole long time. Like it's more immediate care in the dental field. Yeah. 
You know, I would also like to add to that, kind of just getting to know what the patient's goals are during those interactions and then, you know, helping them kind of achieve those goals. Yeah. I kind of like that um, you're kind of like a branch of their primary care. So you do see them over the course of their life. So you can see a child like grow up, go through their awkward stage, come out of it and see what they look like at the end. You can go through all of, you can see a parents, a grandparent, a child, like all three generations. So I think that's kind of cool. Cool. So I, I love everything you guys are saying and I'm curious. So I understand dental school to be typically a four-year path. When during that time, and maybe you guys are in that mode or past that mode, when do you people get serious about looking for a career in dentistry? When do people move from student to dentist? The third year of school. Yeah, so I was going to say I'm in my third year right now. So I constantly get asked, I think like twice a week at least, like, oh, what are you doing after graduation? And it didn't like hit me that I literally am graduating in a year and a half, like exactly almost until people started asking me this every single day. And then I'm like, I didn't even think about it. And now I have to think about it. So I would say that your third year, you start to think about if you want to continue with education or if you want to graduate after four years and go into private practice or something like that. So I think th third years when you have to decide if you're continuing with education or not, because then you have to start doing research or getting letters of recommendation or looking into programs. I completely okay, so, agree with yeah. that. And then at least in your fourth year, once you decide, like, I don't want to go on and specialize, um, that at the beginning of your last semester is when you really start going out and interviewing and trying to find a job opportunity. So a lot of my classmates are going out um, and applying here come January is what the consensus is so far. Okay. Yeah, I think at UConn, like the track is like a little bit off because our first and a half, like the first and a half year we have here, we are in the medical curriculum. So we're taking medical school classes with the med students and then they slowly trickle dental classes into um, our, our track. So just today, I actually asked someone like, what are they doing after graduation? And they were kind of like, hmm, you know, we'll see where, where things take us. I don't really know. But I know that a lot of my classmates are planning to specialize. Like I would like to go into pediatric dentistry. And um, so I think that it's kind, of, it's kind of a little off for my school, but also by fourth year, it definitely like tapers out and we're like all looking for like jobs and like, where we want to specialize in interviewing and stuff. So it sounds like the options are really continuing education or specializing. Um, private practice or what? What are the options? Corporate DSO, private okay. practice. And then there's some, I, we had a lot of people at USC who did the army after school because tuition was so high that they just needed um, to find a way to pay it back. And it was, you know, they did Navy, Army. Cool. And I'm, I'm, I'm on that scholarship track. So I made that decision before dental school. Okay. Okay. So sometimes you make it earlier, but it sounds like for the most part, as you're nearing third, fourth year, you start to make decisions and then it's sort of full speed ahead. So when we first started talking, um, it sounded like there was a lot of these wonderful things, making impact, helping people, uh, working with your hands, you feel some artistry, lifestyle. How much of that do you have to sacrifice or make choices between when you're actually going into looking for a job? A lot. Okay, talk to me about that, Ross. Um, well, I live in LA and it's like pretty difficult when you first graduate to get a job because any job in private practice wants you to have two to five years of experience. Okay. And a lot of the jobs that you get straight out of dental school, they're with um, Medi-Cal offices where you're just seeing like, it's all about quantity and not quality of work. So you're seeing like 35 to 40 patients a day. And it's just kind of like quick, quick, quick. So if you are somebody that wants to practice, you know, cosmetic dentistry and you want to do something like that, it's not, you're not going to be doing that in these offices. 
you're just basically building your resume until you can get that job. So quantity comes at the sacrifice of quality in, in your eyes. Well, yeah, because, you, you know, they don't give you time to spend with every patient. And then HMOs, the insurance only covers certain restorations, which are not the best restoration for the two. So. And and that, does that have an, an, an impact? And I'm sorry for whoever I cut off because I was just thinking, does that have an end long-term impact on that idea of the big impact you were hoping to have? Or I think I, can you, I think my camera like froze. Do you guys still see me or hear me? Yeah. Um, sorry, did you, does that have an impact on the end result? Or does, does this change your hope for the big impact? Does that mess with your big impact you hoped to have? Um, no, I think, you know, what you do is you work in this type of situation for two, three years until you get really comfortable with seeing patients. And then you can, you know, get a job in a more private niche office where, for instance, you want to do cosmetic dentistry, then you can do it in those types of offices and then grow from there. So yeah. this is kind of like after dental school, there's a one year um, program. It's called a GED where you like continue on for a year. This is kind of like that, but you know, in a, but you get it in an office setting. Okay. Okay. What about anyone else? I mean, are there any, and by the way, Roz, your video is frozen for me, but I can hear you. So. Okay. Sorry about Great. that. <laughs> no, no, no. All good. Just wanted you to know. Um, what other things, I mean, do you feel that everything you spoke about, about the wonders of dentistry, do you expect to, or did you have to think about giving some of that up or did you change your priorities in the process of looking for a career in dentistry? I think that's tough to say as someone who's still in dental school, because yeah. I don't really know. I was just going to chime in to what Rose said. So being graduating, um, I definitely looked into that when I was looking for jobs. I didn't want to go into corporate dentistry just because of what you hear about that is quantity versus quality of dentistry and not saying all corporate dental offices practice that, but that tends to be a general theme that you see over and over again. So I definitely, when I was applying, um, I took a look into when I was interviewing to see, you know, how many patients they saw, how many, how much time they allotted, what types of procedures were they doing the most. Um, just taking a look at a sample schedule of a day or two um, during the week to see what they were treating, uh, what types of procedures and stuff like that, it was very helpful in helping me to choose a position that I felt like was a good fit for me. Yeah. Well, one of the things no one's really talked about, and I'm curious what factor that plays in, is financial. Um, what role does the money on the table play in the jobs that either you take or perhaps your co your um, peers, people that you're in school with, what role and how do you guys talk about that, if at all? I think there's, everybody kind of looks for a balance, um, you know, making sure that you are paid well. Um, for a lot of my classmates, at least, money wasn't the most important factor. I think it was more of a balance, uh, making sure it's a good fit for you the hours a week that you're working, the hours that you're working. Some practices are open from like 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., which is an ideal schedule for many people. Um, some people are working some Saturdays. So I think that, you know, also plays into effect, like, do you want to work weekends? Uh, for some people, they were money oriented and that's what their main thing was and they're willing to work and all of that. But I think it just comes down to what your priorities are. But for at least my friend group, it seemed like balance was a key component. Cool. Thanks, Janice. What about everyone else? What, what role does that type of stuff play in either your personal decision making or the way people in school are talking about the decisions they're making? Uh, I feel like I feel like dental school can be a competitive place, <laughs> okay. so you don't always get transparency from classmates about about what offers are, what they look like. Uh, I mean, the biggest factor that goes into how how much you think you should make it is a, usually your loan payment. If you have loans, if you don't have loans, maybe you're more likely to only look for something that's perfect for you if you have no loans. But if you do have loans, you want to try and find something where you can make a little bit more. You're willing to put it those extra hours from five to seven at night or work on Saturdays. 
So, um, but I think balance is balance is most important. Cool. Um, Chad hit on something really interesting that I'd love to hear more about, which is the atmosphere. What is, so we all talked about, it seems like for the most part, whether your schools are on different timelines from one another, everyone at your school, once they've decided they're not perhaps pursuing an, a specialty and continuing on with education, there are a lot of people maybe looking for similar jobs, the same jobs. What is the atmosphere like in the recruitment job hunt process? Um, at least at Arizona, it's not crazy. Um, there's a lot of people that are from a lot of other states in, in our program. So there's not a lot of people that are actually staying um, in and around the dental school, which I think is a little bit more abnormal from a lot of other dental schools that are more state run versus a, a private dental school. So um, everybody's kind of going back to their home states is what the vibe I get. Okay. What about the rest of you? Is it similar to the situation with Jordan where people are coming, getting their education and dispersing back to where they were? And so there's more perhaps camaraderie around it. I know Chad mentioned maybe some competitiveness at UIC. Yeah, UIC was only only in state. Uh, okay. my, my class only accepted in state. So most people were staying here in the job market after graduating for others. I can't really speak to because I went to residency. But after residency, uh, because it's match, everyone kind of goes back wherever. So there's more opportunity in each location once you're a specialist. I was gonna say it's kind of hard for me to know yet, just because, like fall semester of your third year, people aren't really talking about like jobs yet. They're more talking about whether they want to specialize or not, and so that kind of separates like who's like needs to be more competitive still versus who's like relaxing and kind of like just riding out dental school now. So I don't really know so much about the job search thing, but it is definitely still competitive for people who want to pursue a residency. Okay. Now I know, oh, sorry, Celia, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, for me, it is kind of hard to tell because I'm in my third year, but from what I hear from the fourth years talking is that they are just going on inter interviews for residency. And then um, a lot of um, my classmates also, we have a mentoring program and so a lot of the mentors that they pair us with take us under their wing and like invite us into their offices. So I think some of them are doing that as well. But other than that, the residencies and kind of just dispersing from Connecticut. Okay. And I realize Chad told us he's in pediatric dentistry, but Roz and Janice, what field of dentistry are you two both in? Just general. Okay. General dentistry. Yeah. I'm in I'm in general family dentistry. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So one of the reason I ask is I, I get the, I've heard a few comments here and there about just the perceptions of different types of roles. And so I'm curious where those perceptions come from. Um, and, and maybe we can kind of talk smack for a quick second and say, you know, what are the stereotypes of who goes into what type of field? Do those exist within a dentistry school? Or are you saying, oh, they're going, Oh, they're a pediatric dentist. Oh, they're in general family dentistry. Um, is there something about that? Why is that? What do people know about it? Corporate dentistry. Who goes into what type of field and why? If there is that perception and correct me if there isn't. There definitely is. All right, hit me with why. Let's talk straight. Um, I mean, there's stereotypes of like who fits into what category. Like if. For example, if someone walks down the hall and you're like, oh yeah, they're definitely gonna do like this or X, Y, Z. Like you can tell, there's something called a gunner in dental school. Yeah, definitely. That, that's like from day one, they're the ones that will turn a classmate in for like cheating or they would like stab someone in the back if, to get a better grade. They would look pat, like they just, they do whatever they can to get on top and they, I mean, they, they usually want to do a residency and they usually want to do one where rank and GPA matters. So that's usually like oral surgery or orthodontics. Um, but yeah, the gunners all do OS. They're the ones that like 
you know, the first week of dental school when everyone goes home at 4 p.m., they're there till 9 o'clock at night, just, you know, organizing their teeth for the hundredth time. So there's like definitely gunners that like they just eat, breathe, drink dental school and they are most likely number one OS, number two ortho. I can also give the give the comparison between uh, what what interviews look like for residency programs, like for pediatrics. We walk in, we all socialize, talk to each other, have like easy conversation. For Prost and OS, they walk in, sit by themselves, don't talk to anybody. It's just kind of like every field kind of has its own personality type that usually lends itself to the field. Okay. Um, yeah. Dumb question: Is OS oral surgery? Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Okay, so they're gunners. The gunners who are more cutthroat, they're they're gunning for it. I get it. Uh, what else? Pediatric dentistry has a little more social aspect. Pediatric uh -huh. is really friendly. They're like, you know, the like, they're always willing to help. They're really friendly. Um, I don't Super know. At USC, stuff. the pediatric, the people who are going into peds, they were not as competitive as the other specialties. Okay. Okay, that's competitive. All right, what what else? What's like the opposite of a gunner? Sorry. What are they? Um, <laughs> wait, Someone sorry, Fred, you raised just your happy hand. To be in dental school. Just happy to be there. Okay, love that. What makes you different then from a gunner? What does it mean to just be happy to be here? That well, so there were multiple times where all of our like testing scores were re released to the entire school. And to be honest, I just didn't care. As long as I got a passing grade and I was happy with the fact that I had passed whatever test it was or passed whatever class it was, I, I didn't care about my GPA at that point. I was just, I'm in dental school, I'm here to graduate and then start working. Like that was my mindset from day one. And that was completely different from a lot of the gunners that people say. And so for you, because you're on the scholarship track, you know where you're going, right? You're gonna go into the army to do that dental work? And that changed my mindset too. Yeah. You know, that all I needed to do was graduate and then yeah. I don't lose my scholarship, so. <laughs> right. And do you think that you're able to go through dental school perhaps with a different perspective because your future is so certain? Probably um, having something lined up afterwards, knowing that what is going to happen is already planned out for me for the next four years. Yeah. It's like, okay, okay. I know what I need to do. I know what the next step is. Somebody's already planned it out for me. Yeah. Made well, animal school a lot. I don't want to say easier because obviously it was hard, but knowing that I didn't have to get an A in every class made life more enjoyable, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what about the rest of you guys? What does that uncertainty lead to? And this could be in your past versus if you're still in school currently, do you, do you have an outlook of concern about approaching postgraduate careers? Do you feel a certainty of what you're aiming for? And you don't necessarily have to enumerate what that would be, but do you feel like you already know where you want to go with that path? And, you know, Chad and, and Jenice and Roz, maybe if you did want to know, if you did already know by the time you graduated? I think for me, there was some uncertainty because I um, wanted to specialize in endo, uh, which is like root canals. But towards the end of, end of dental school, I was so burnt out and so tired that I was like, I, you know, I can't do this anymore. Like, I just want to start working. And then I, in my head, I was like, okay, well, I'll go back and specialize after working. And, you know, maybe that will happen. I'm still, it's still undecided for me. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me about the burnout part. I've heard that dentistry school can, dental school can be like survival mode in moments. Yeah. All the, oh my God. All the time. Just totally. surviving day by day, taking it day by day, week by week. So how do you marry surviving with postgraduate career hunting? I feel like dental school is kind of like you hit the, at the end of your third year, halfway through the third year, depending on when you take boards, like 
first two years are kind of steady. You're studying a lot, and then third year it gets really, really chaotic, really fast. And then by the like halfway through your fourth year, you're back on the ups and starting to look at things in a brighter perspective. You're almost graduated. You have a job in the pipeline. Hopefully, or you've matched the residency program. Um, for me, burnout was that like third year mid application process, waiting on interviews where you're like. I don't know how much energy I have left to do any of these things. How am I going to go to another two years? Um, yeah. But I mean, a lot of people get a second wind. I feel like everybody in my program kind of went through that together. So. Yeah. I think like each year of dental school, you have a different, You each year you face like different struggles and it changed literally every year. It's a different issue. And then your mental state changes like every year, like at D1, the majority of the people are like just anxious starting new like dental school grad school it's me hard and then d2 it's like okay i've been here i know what's going on it's just like you're just like at least at ohio state you were just completely pummeled under books like constantly like we had three tests a week like it was just unreal and so d2 is where massive burnout happens um spring d2 at osu Dude, what the fuck? Okay, come on. What is happening? Recording in progress. You had to do a lot of work on patients. So I think the teachers, their main thing was like helping you find those patients and like uh, students would share patients. So that's what their main role was. It wasn't anything after school. So there was no guidance um, on yeah. what was going to happen after you graduate. Does anyone For else? Us, um, okay, go ahead. It wasn't or it hasn't been where they're really looking to help us. I mean, we had a, a week long course as to um, how to interview and like what to look for in terms of job opportunities where this particular professor believed the job market was going. Um, and he gave his personal beliefs into the private office setting versus DSO versus military and all that. Uh, but in terms of helping you look for jobs. Um, at least AT still is very much pushing um, community health. Uh, they make us do um, get a certificate in uh, public health in order to graduate. So oh. they very much want everybody to at least consider going into community health, public health, um, take those scholarships, take those jobs. Um, that's what their motto and their mission is. So that's where most of the job opportunities that at least they send out via email are all about. So there's definitely a clear focus from the administration. Anywhere else? I mean, is there any, and it might be guidance, it might be something you think they're pushing, whether that's helpful or hurtful. I'm just curious how impactful they are in the process. I know that at, at UIC faculty, because I said it's it was my group was all in state uh, faculty, yeah. were pretty pretty helpful, either giving advice on residency programs or helping you find jobs. There were students, dental students, who went to work for their faculty, um, or who have whatever went to work for prior students, the faculty for recent placed. So they were they were pretty helpful. Cool. Yeah, I can't speak too much to it yet, but I know that um, we're about to have a resume, like resume meetings and workshops coming up. Um, they haven't started yet, but I actually think the first one is this Friday. And um, I know that when I was interviewing, like they are 
their thing that they pushed was their students going into residency. So they really pride themselves on um, the match rate here. And yeah, so I don't know. I haven't heard any complaints from the fourth years, but maybe they wouldn't complain if they didn't make it. <laughs> um, okay. I want to kind of just put it out there and everyone can say their own opinion, but is there a sort of worst place to work, worst place to end up in dentistry and why? And this isn't not, it's not asking so much about your personal opinion as much as I'm asking about like what gets the most negative chatter. At my school, corporate dentistry definitely gets the most negative chatter. Um, they really don't want us going there. They don't think it's healthy for our mental state. And yeah, they don't want us going to corporate dentistry. So, okay. Yeah, agreeing with Celia, corporate dentistry seems to get the most negative um, vibes when it comes to talking about a dental workplace, only because I think so many times you hear people saying that um, it's over treatment and you're seeing a lot of number of patients per day and it's not really quality dentistry. Okay. I agree with all of them. Yeah. Um, I worked in a corporate dental office though and I think that I had a great experience even though I was worked like to the bones and I saw way more patients and I didn't do top quality dental work because I couldn't, I learned a lot. And I saw things that I've never seen, I did not see in dental school. It helped me um, speed up my skill. And it kind of, it was like really, really, really good education. I don't regret it. It has a bad rep, but I think that if you kind of, you know, just go in and do it and do your best, you take a lot from it. Okay. I definitely so it's, agree it's, with that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Maria. Corporate dentistry has a really bad rep at Ohio State, but also at the same time, we get a lot, like a ton of corporate like recruiters coming to our school and pitching to us like all the time, at least one like one one or two a month. Um and they also like will like sponsor a bunch of stuff. I don't know if this happens at your dental school. I'm sure it does, but like they will like try to like sugar us up and stuff and like pitch to us um and it happens all the time so i mean i've gone to a couple of them and the way they make it sound like they brought in like osu alumni to talk about their experience like the ones that work in like corporate dentistry and they all have positive things to say based on like what Roz was saying like the mentorship that they give and learn and how much you learn is the true benefit, but the quality of dentistry might not be the best, but it's like what you learn as a dentist, if you're not super confident coming out of dental school, like this is like a expedited, like GPR program. Like you're doing a, just a crap ton of stuff and you learn a lot. So there's like a benefit and a disadvantage, I guess. Okay. So a lot of chatter around the same type of industry, but, but maybe it's, it's getting a bad rap and not necessarily fully known the in people don't know the ins and outs of it it's just getting a negative reputation whether it is right or not doesn't need to be something we have a decision on in this room but the recruitment aspect is very interesting is is corporate dentistry the only career track where there is that type of traditional recruitment sort of whining and dining it sounds like compared to other options the other options that i've heard about are more like you reach out to uh, prospective dentists or dental offices in an area that you want to work in and okay. then you're looking for an associate position uh, to kind of come in at the ground floor or an established op office where maybe the dentist is like 55 60 and they're looking to kind of slow down um, but maybe they're not putting out feelers and you need to be the one that initiates and be like, I'm moving to this area and I would like to work for you, or I'd like to come and meet you at your office. And we can discuss if you're willing to bring on an associate. That's kind of the other avenue that I've heard. Okay. So 
it does feel like a lot of you kicked off this conversation talking about lifestyle for dentistry, particularly when pitted against traditional medical career tracks. Lifestyle is meant to be better. In general, do you think that the practical experience of being in dentistry has the same lifestyle you hoped to attain? And maybe this is more for Jenis, Raz, and Chad who are already in the dental field. But do you feel that lifestyle comes to fruition? Because it seemed to be a priority at the beginning. I think so. Um, for pediatrics, we still I still take emergency call. Um, so, but I mean, in residency, you get used to going in and call. It's not a big deal. Also, kids have more trauma than adults. But um, I would say lifestyle is what I would hope it would be. I, I anticipate lifestyle will continue to improve with time, practice, ownership, those types of, types of things. Uh, but overall, I mean, the expectations are what they what they really are. And compared to medicine, you know, they're on call all the time, they have hospital affiliations, all sorts of stuff like that. Then every every medical physician wants to work the hours that most dentists work. Yeah. Cool. Anything to add? Anyone, even if you're still in dental school? you expect from lifestyle versus what you hope for, what you thought, what you expect will be reality? Um, I don't know, even in school, as like, even when I'm exhausted, we're like right alongside the medical students and I'm exhausted, but the medical students are literally dying. Um, <laughs> and they're like, they're working themselves and which is, you know, it's fine. They, they, I almost feel I almost feel bad sometimes when they ask me or like we're talking and it's like it almost feels like I'm boasting about like how much time I have while still working hard but I have more time and um, I don't know it feels like when we leave and we go to our careers um, I just hope that they like what they've chosen because they've invested so much and I've invested a lot too but um, I think that I will be happy with my lifestyle just because of all the dentists I've shadowed. They've like, I've never shadowed an unhappy dentist so far. And even I actually did shadow one unhappy dentist, but he was happy with his lifestyle. He just didn't <laughs> want to do the dental work. <laughs> so yeah. I think it also depends where you live. Okay. Because you know, in LA, the insurance compensation for a lot of procedures is really low. So you basically, if you have student loans, you have no option but to do quantity to be able to survive. But for instance, in like a state like Texas, the compensation is much higher. So you can, you know, your lifestyle is way different. And, you know, it really depends where you live and the insurance and how the compensation is. And that kind of affects everything. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm going to shift us because you guys started to bring up DSOs, corporate dentistry. I kind of, I got the impression that there is a generally negative perception, but perhaps they do some things right, or maybe they're just getting a bad rap. So I'd love to know what DSOs and corporate dentistry, are there some example like companies that are DSO corporate dentistry or their classic ones that everyone knows? Um, Western Dental. Yeah, I'm okay. familiar with Western Dental, Aspen Dental, Comfort Dental, and PDS. Okay. Those are the ones I know as well. Perfect. Okay. Um, and I know, Morgan, you mentioned that you've at least sat in on a couple of these sort of, they come to the campus and they talk about has anyone else sat in on anything or learned more about it? Yep. Okay. So Jordan, Morgan, um, what's the sort of spiel? What are they selling? Um, I've okay, so I've only sat in on a comfort dental okay. one. Um, and they were just kind of their spiel was mostly like trying to give themselves a good like a good rep. They're trying to like tell us all the positives, which I'm sure all of them were gonna do, but the way they structure things, I guess is a little bit different than some other ones because you actually can buy into it and have your own prep. Like you can buy and 
they'll like um, Comfort Dental will find the land and do all your marketing, but it's your office and you can have an associate and you make 55% of whatever you bring in and all that stuff. So you can have like your own office, but it's just under their umbrella. So that's kind of like what they do. They kind of just talk about how they structure things that's slightly different than others, I guess, but I don't know because I haven't listened to the other ones. Okay. PDS is the same. PDS gives you like a ownership. Um, yeah, you're allowed to own up to 49% of a particular office and then um, they find the building, um, they renovate it for you and they do all the marketing and whatnot. So I think the only one I was sat in on PDS and um, Aspen came and spoke with us. Now theirs was more like you get a salary. Mm -hmm. okay. I was just going to ask Okay. You have like certain requirements as to what you're expected to make as like a first year dentist or a second year dentist or a third year dentist. Like you have like certain qualifications that they expect of you. And then if you make over that, you get compensated. And if you make less than that, then they're like, take some of your pay away. So, okay. so I didn't really particularly care for that business model. Yeah, so it seems like with Aspen versus the others, you're more of a salaried employee of the company versus having some sense of like private practice needs safety net kind of. Well, for like a PDS associate, you don't have any ownership in the practice. Okay. Um, you're hired on and then you make a certain percentage of what you um, collect. It's called adjusted production, but it's essentially collection. Okay. But it does sound like PDS and Comfort are kind of singing the same song. They're weaving the same tale of ownership opportunity, but there is marketing coverage. Why do you think they're talking to you about that type of stuff? Does that matter? I feel like that doesn't sound like anything about why anyone got into dentistry. So I'm just wondering what's the, what's the sales tactic there? The sales tactic? They, oh, sorry. Yeah, Roz, you want to go and then we'll have Morgan go after. Um, the sales tactic is basically since you have ownership, the more work you do, the more you produce, the more you're pocketing. So the whole tactic is they put your name on the door. They, you know, they make it your office, um, even though you're not the majority owner. And then because, you know, you, you mentally think like, oh, this is my office. You produce more, you're more aggressive. You have the hygienist upsell, you make sure everything's clean, you run it better. Whereas when you're an associate, you're like, okay, I have no stake in this. I'm just going to, you know, you probably want to just make your base salary some days and go home early. Is the reason they're talking about the part ownership, is that a typical quest in dentistry to own? Yes. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. And and the dentist, so it sounds like, Morgan, you were saying dentists were there. It wasn't like some corporate entity. So what was that like? What were the, what were the dentists saying versus what the materials were saying? Or what's the source um, of information like? So they, like Comfort Dental brought in a recruiter who like did the whole intro and all that stuff but I guess to make it more relatable to us they brought in OSU alumni who work at Comfort Dentals to talk to us about like their transition how they like it and all that kind of stuff so I think they did that just to like be like look OSU people have graduated and they're happy and they do it you could do it too I, so I, I think it's just to make it relatable but I think a big tech like a big sales thing of why people might join is just because a lot of us don't have business backgrounds and a lot of us don't want to have to figure out if they can trust their office manager if they're going to like find a good one or something so they take that part like a, like some of that part away you still have to like run your office a little bit but a lot of the real estate and the marketing and a lot of the business is like they worry about that that's really interesting because I feel like one of you mentioned that your uh, university faculty gave you at most a one hour class on how to make a LinkedIn. What is the guidance on actually 
the business side of dentistry if you want to pursue something in private practice? Is there guidance that you're in your programs? And if that's the ultimate goal to attain. At OSU, we have two classes, like it basically one after the other. It's practice management one and practice management two. You take it one year D3 year, one year D4 year. Um, I'm still in the first one, but so far it's like not super helpful, but they like make you make like a fake uh, business plan and um, write up like this whole report as if you were going to present it to a loan or a, a bank to get a loan. And so it's like practicing all that kind of stuff, but, and they have like speakers come in and talk to us about how they did it and all that stuff. So, I mean, it's like helpful, but it's not cause I'm sure I'm going to forget it by the time it applies to me. So, yeah. Faculty members that I trust at Arizona have told me that the classes that even they got when they were in dental school, um, weren't helpful at all, even compared to the ones that we're getting, which apparently are so much better, but whatever. <laughs> Um, they said that all of their business knowledge came from continuing education courses after they had graduated, okay. where that's, if you want to run a business, if that's something that you're interested in, then you need to go and you need to take your continuing education credits in order to actually learn from somebody that's done it and done it successfully, rather than a professor at a dental school that's maybe not run a successful dental practice in over 20 years, you know, things change. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like Roz, you actually cut your teeth in a a DSO corporate dentistry, um, setting, but I'd be curious to say I were a peer of yours. I'm fourth year and I'm considering working with either Western Aspen comfort or PDS. Um, what would you tell me? What I, I want your honest opinion. What do you think about this career choice for me? What would you say? So if I were you, I would weigh um, which one has the best compensation because this is going to be temporary. You're not going to spend the rest of your career working in one of those corporate offices. This is for maybe two to three years. You build your resume and then, you know, you either open your own office or if you want, you go into a better, a private office where you see less patients and it's all fee for service. So they don't take insurance. Um, I would, you know, write like, you know, do a little Zen diagram or whatever of each one of those. I would see which has the highest compensation. I would go on Yelp and I would read all the reviews for each of those offices. And then based on that, um, I would pick one of the offices and I would, you know, just be like, okay, this is like a two year extension of dental school. I'm going to one, try to make as much money as I can. And two, I'm going to try to see, like learn and see as much as I can before I go into a more higher end practice where the consequences of, you know, a mess up is much higher. Okay. Interesting. I definitely want to come back to the consequences of a mess up being higher. But what about the rest of you? I want to go into corporate dentistry. I'm considering one of these four. Um, What do you think about my path? So at OSU, we do something called Ohio Project, where at your like fourth year, you get sent out to different locations around the state. And um, comfort, there's a lot of comfort dentals in Ohio. And they're actually, some of their offices are actually um, sites that you could be sent to and any, but you can, you can go to any comfort dental you want to. So if you want to do your Ohio project extra days at blank in like comfort dental in whatever city you want to do it in, like you can do that. Every comfort dental in Ohio is like registered with our Ohio project to get credit for that. So I guess they have, I would say, if you're interested in that, I would spend your extra days at the offices looking at which one you might be interested in. Cool. So it's a viable path. It's a path people take and they're clearly saying something that's maybe mildly compelling, um, giving you some sort of path forward. Do you have peers who are exploring it? And because I think what's interesting about what Raz says is it, it sounded a little more financially motivated, which is very different from how you guys all started your conversation with your sort of altruistic pursuits of big impact and helping people and interacting with patients. 
Um, do you feel that corporate dentistry options can offer you those things or offer people those things, your, your peers? To a certain extent, yes, I think it can. Um, but I also think that a lot of times people are caught up in how much debt that they're in and the corporate dental model is a very safe and viable option for those that need to make their uh, loan payments where they're going in knowing that what these um, DSOs are offering is going to be enough to cover the lifestyle that they want, the hours that they're going to work and the pay that they're going to receive in order to get to the point where they're doing the dentistry that they want to do. But that's later on in their career, like Roz said. Yeah. Sad, Chad, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, Chad. No, no problem. I think I think that the biggest biggest motivation to go into corporate is that you're still learning how to do things. If you mess up, you don't think you're gonna be there long term. I think that's like the like you're gonna make a ton of money, you're gonna make mistakes, but you're gonna be out of there in enough time that it's not gonna be your problem to to deal with those mistakes. But I don't think I don't know anybody who views corporate dentistry as like a long term uh, long term profession. So one thing both you, Chad, and Roz mentioned is this sort of, it's a safe place to make mistakes. Why is that? What is it about the clientele or the, what is it about corporate dentistry that makes it okay to make mistakes? Whereas in a private practice setting, mistakes are a higher stakes game. I, in residency, we call it geographic success. Like you're there for two years, everything you do is successful because by the time what you're doing fails, you're not there anymore. Um, I think that having like not putting your name as an owner, you, you don't feel as connected as much. You feel like there's the safety net of people to kind of catch you if you make mistakes. It's also the mistake isn't really like tied to because let's say, you know, you open a practice and it's called Ross City DDS. If I make a mistake and it, they write on my Yelp page, you know, that's going to be tied to me for the rest of my life because I own the office. But at a corporate office, if you make a mistake, usually they like write the review or the Google review for the office, not for the doctor. Got it. Is that even the case with the ones that you mentioned this, like you're owning some of it? Um, no, no, I think for that, it's a little different. The PDS, I think you have your like PDS is, uh, I like their model because you have ownership but I don't know like straight out of dental school if it's the best idea to go to a PDS. I think out of dental school, it's better to work as an associate and then maybe transition to PDS. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'd love to talk a little bit more about, actually, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about Comfort Dental. I know Morgan sat in on something with them. Um, I just wanna know, quick show of hands, who have heard, who has heard of Comfort Dental on the call? And Genesis, maybe you just chime in. Yeah, I've heard of them, but I've never been affiliated with them or, you know, yeah, yeah. like a pep talk or anything from them. Okay. Know of them. And Roz, I'm sorry, yeah. your video is still frozen for me. You know of them too? Yes. Okay, cool. So how, I, the Comfort Dental model from what you guys have been saying has this ownership aspect a little different from, I think Aspen, you were saying is more like you're a salaried employee. So how widely known is Comfort Dental? Where does it rank in comparison to the other corporate dentistry model options? Talk to me about it. I know a lot of people would, um, who don't like Aspen's model. I think Aspen's is pretty low on the totem pole. Okay. So maybe Comfort Dental has less negative perception than Aspen at Ohio? Um, the people that I like have spoke to briefly about it, that's kind of like the, the just, yeah. But I mean, I don't think I can speak for like everyone in Ohio. Okay. Anyone else, anything 
different? Has has anyone's university shared anything about comfort dental with them? I know we were talking about faculty steering certain things. Chad's shaking his head. Celia, no. I know Morgan, you have. And Jordan. I'm sorry, what? I, I was just curious if your university has shared any information. Have you been sitting in on any sessions or these recruitment sessions at all? Um, our school does lunch and learns where they okay. will open up um, kind of like our lecture halls to whoever wants to come in and buy us lunch. And yeah, Comfort Dental came and uh, presented to us and it was very similar to what uh, Morgan said. Um, okay. That, like, okay. Honestly, it was almost word for word. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same recruiter. <laughs> Maybe. Um, the So since you both said it on something, what was the general takeaway when people walk out of the room? Was something working, not working? What's What's the takeaway or do people talk about it at all when you walk out of a lunch and learn room? Not really. Um, you know, they, they butt up pretty close to um, the time frame of when we start lunch versus when our next patient is. So, um, you know, our lunch is from 12 to 1 and at 12.50, Pretty much everybody has to leave to go set up for their next patient. So there isn't okay. a lot of discussion about how that particular lunch and learn went that day. Okay. So I know internalized yep. into whatever your own thoughts are. Yep. And I know for you, Jordan, obviously your career path is a bit set, but if you could put yourself in a position where it wasn't, thinking back to that lunch and learn session, what compelling things were said? Compelling things were that, at least with these models and having kind of like a big corporate um, business backing you, is that you get um, a lot of the insurances that you would pay for yourself um, covered, like your liability insurance or your disability insurance. Um, those things come through the corporate office that are provided for you that you don't have to pay for or worry about. Um, the other thing is that a lot of the CE courses, uh, whether you're going through PDS, they put on their own stuff. That's, you know, it's like a week long and they send you to Las Vegas or um, Los Angeles, something like that. Um, and I know that at least Comfort Dental, I believe they did it where they gave you like a stipend where you could go and you could do whatever CE courses that you wanted to do. And what those are, those are some of the really nice incentives of working in that corporate style that are provided for you, especially when you're first coming out when you don't really know everything that you need to do in order to actually practice what we took four years to learn and whatever state that you settle down in, having that corporate backing is is a nice first step. Is yeah. kind of the vibe that I got. Yeah. And and so so there's definitely incentives. It sounds like there are incentives that make it interesting. And then what what is it about I'm trying to think of how to exactly word this question, but does I'm just trying to think of like Janice, Chad, obviously you entered into a different career. So does any of this sound like something that you're like, wow, that is not what I knew about corporate dentistry. I didn't consider it. Maybe you're not going to ever consider it, but does any of this ring surprising to you? Um, considering maybe you two are the ones who know the least about it. And what is surprising about that? Um, just speaking from my experience, so I did go to a few um, little like seminars with um, corporate dentistry. Like I went to one with Aspen and they were pretty big on CEs and pretty big on mentorship. But I felt like that wasn't something that I really was like looking forward to that I felt like I really needed a whole lot. For me, it was more of could I give quality dentistry going back to the values that why we went into dentistry in the first place. I didn't want to be stuck in that model of where it was quantity and over treatment and stuff like that. 
Although I think a lot of the corporate dental practices are getting away from that and um, in terms of letting the dentist treatment plan on their own, I think they're getting a little bit better with that than they were in the past. Um, but those were some things that like I looked for that I thought, you know, that I just figured like this wasn't a match that I was looking for in corporate dentistry and I, it wasn't going to be a good fit for me at least. Yeah. Okay. Chad, anything that that you think you didn't know or maybe was just not clear to you? Um, I'm just trying to understand just the differences in perception around one career track versus another, especially from people uh, who compared a totally different one. I I mean, I didn't know that there were corporate dental offices that were giving you money to own 49% of your practice. That was kind of new to me. We don't really have PDS that I know of here, but... Uh, people must, there must be practices that are going under their own names <laughs> that are owned by them. So, Chad, what state are you in? Illinois. I don't think uh, corporate is recognized there quite yet. Like corporate in general? Yeah, like the it has to be accepted by each individual state in order to use corporate dentistry. Like North Carolina just passed the law that allows corporate dentistry to exist that was like a big deal there's still like practices here that own like 350 offices so it's not corporate maybe but it's like <laughs> privately owned corporate offices okay right. I agree. Yeah. okay yeah, they're corporate okay similar concept um I, I want to go back. One thing that you guys said that was really interesting was just this idea of kind of low stakes mistakes, which might just be you're thinking at it from the dentist perspective. But what about the clientele? Is somebody who walks into any of these types of DSOs, Comfort Dental specifically, are they different from the people who walk into other types of general dentistry practices? Do you serve different people? Are they in specific locations? I think the corporate dental offices tend to take like all types of insurances, whereas private practices, a lot of them here at least are like fee for service. Um, they also tend to be in more rural aspects, um, kind of like on the border, or at least um, certain states I've noticed are a little bit not so much in more of the popular cities, but a little bit more on the outskirts, like the suburbs of certain areas. But the more common trend that I've seen is that they basically accept a lot of insurances and even people that don't have insurance, they offer a lot of um, cheaper options. I know um, working in private practice dentistry, um, sometimes, you know, the dentist complain like they're offering things were much lower. So it's kind of hard to compete sometimes, but then you kind of have to emphasize the quality of dentistry that you feel like you can cater to um, in private practice versus corporate. Okay. So my dad uh, was a dentist and he uh, talked to me about whenever a corporate office came into kind of his competing area where they were booked out like four or five, maybe six months ahead in their schedule, that would be the next time that a patient could get in to even see the dentist, let alone if they have an emergency, um, just because they do accept almost all kinds of insurance. I think most corporate models accept all insurance except for uh, Medicare, Medicaid, um, dental insurance. That's kind of where they draw the line. So it's almost more complicated to get into that than a private practice. Oh, it's 100% more complicated. Um, just because you have to follow whatever rules um, that particular insurance covers, let alone if they'll cover it at a certain time, certain procedure, like say it's been a year and a day, that's when they'll cover a new set of exam and x-rays. But if it's like 11 months and 30 days, then they'll deny your claim. So like, even if you can yeah. get in on that particular day, sorry, we can't see you because we're not going to get paid to do this exam or this x-ray. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was almost thinking about it from the patient aspect as well. Um, more difficult for a patient to get in. Um, cool. So 
since we're coming up at 815 right now, 815 Mountain, um, I want to just quickly do an exercise and we're all going to play a game where we're going to pretend we're all sitting in a comfort dental lunch and learn session and we're hearing sort of like the elevator pitch from comfort dental. Um, and I want to share three with you and I just want to know, let's pretend everybody who's already got a job, you're a fourth year student, all options are on the table. I want to know which spiel is most resonating with you. So the first one, I'm just going to read them to you guys. At Comfort Dental, you have the opportunity to own and operate your own office, but you'll also have the support of corporate to help you manage the business and the marketing. This sounds a little bit like what I was hearing you guys talk about as the current promise from what you would get from a comfort dental, but I am curious what your initial reactions are to that. Positive, negative, what do you think? And anyone can chime in. I think that sounds pretty positive and straightforward. Okay. I yes. also think that having and going into owning your own business right away, even if it's only like 49% is a little intimidating, even if you don't want to own a business, because a lot of fourth year dental students don't know how to even run their own practice, let alone be the lead dentist. So I think a lot of people are looking for associate positions or mentoring where they have a, a senior dentist or somebody that's there helping them. I think that's probably what I would be looking for. Interesting. So that wasn't like in the speech, but I know comfort dental does they it's like mandatory mentorship or something they like have to you i think you have to start as an associate and then you buy into it or something but i know that they like the their mentorship thing was like the one thing that they like really harped on is like everyone gets paired with a mentor and it's it's what you make of it basically so that okay. just wasn't in their speech but i know that they do harp on that okay so maybe the idea of ownership can seem intimidating, even though perhaps it's a long-term goal. Um, cool, all right, I'm gonna read another one. The opportunity for variety, choice, and autonomy is great at Comfort Dental. It allows you to practice a full spectrum of dentistry services in any field that interests you. There are no corporate quotas that you need to fulfill. And again, elevator pitch, obviously a meeting would be much longer, but just if you were, getting a rough takeaway from a business model for your path and career. What do you think about that? I think that one was good because it takes away a lot of like the fear of what corporate might take away from you. So the fact that they're saying you can do full spectrum, do whatever you're interested in. I think that they, that was like good. What about this idea of performing full spectrum of dentistry services? I know Raz started to touch on that. You saw some things you'd ever seen before. Um, someone else mentioned that you're doing just everything you've learned over the last four years. Is there something about corporate dentistry that you get to do more stuff than you would if you were going into any other field or career track? Exactly. At least what I've heard from previous, sorry, um, I was just gonna say, at least what I've heard from previous graduates, it seems like they do a lot of crowns um, in corporate dentistry, like anything that's an MOD, they go ahead and like, a MOD is like a three surface filling, anything that's a three surface filling, they go ahead and treatment plan it as crowns. Is that, uh, just to decode that for us, us non-dentistry folks over here, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, I guess it just depends on if there is a need. I mean, I'm not saying that every three surface filling will need a crown, but it tends to be that corporate dentistry right away thinks, okay, three surfaces means it needs a crown. And it could in some situations, but not in every single case. Yeah, that's what I've heard too, is that they're a little bit more aggressive with their treatment planning rather than, um, maybe sitting back and waiting what you could do in a private office where you go from a filling and maybe the filling fails and then you go to a crown um, and that saves the patient money, but it's at the cost of time where a lot of maybe corporate offices don't value that. And they say, well, the likelihood of this 
large filling needing a crown in two years and three years is pretty likely, then let's just do the crown now and be done with it so I can move on and see another patient. Maybe I'm missing something here, but wouldn't that be the choice of the dentist handling it, not like corporate dentistry as a whole? That's exactly right. Um, you can definitely have autonomy in the office, um, but I've heard that you kind of get some pressure from either your senior dentist or maybe hmm. uh, the people that own the other 51% is that, hey, this is kind of how we run things. This is how you, this is how we make a dental business model successful is by you being slightly more aggressive than what you're doing right now. Because when you talk about a three surface filling versus a crown, you're talking about maybe $170 coming from insurance versus $600 coming from insurance. And in reality, both treatment plans would are considered to be in line of reasonable. So there's a philosophy for pursuing more aggressive, more costly treatments, or this is the, what you hear. That's what I hear. Yes. And it's not the worst dentistry that you could do. Um, as long as patients are covered, it, it's just, uh, you hear about the, oh my gosh, I have a, a one surface, like a really small filling. And this dentist at Aspen, like treatment plan, six crowns. And then they come to a private office and they're like, you just need like a couple of fillings. There's no need for you to go to crowns. Those are the kind of the horror stories that you hear about. Okay. All right, I'm gonna give you my last one here. The goal of Comfort Dental is to treat underserved populations. The patients that most dentists ignore are the patients that we are happy to help. Takeaways, thoughts, positive, negative, believability, non-believability as compared to the other two. I feel like uh, believability is pretty low because that would be a Medicaid. Like we know that corporate dentistry doesn't see a lot of Medicaid patients depending on what state what state it is um so i don't know that i feel like the people that you're recruiting if they really want to see underserved populations of patients they would go into public aid chad's exactly right i mean i'm the external rotations that i'm doing for arizona right now are all in community health centers and they see strictly Medicare, Medicaid patients, or patients that have um, low enough incomes that they qualify for their sliding fee scale, and they're getting like full root canals for like $40. Um, it's just some of the stuff that they're asking me to do is crazy. I wouldn't consider it to be sound dentistry, but that's kind of how things operate out at these community health centers where they're just trying to give somebody an extra year out of their tooth before it needs to come out. It's, it's so bizarre. It goes against everything that we're taught in dental school, but that's kind of what Medicare, Medicaid patients get. Okay. So there's almost an inequity of care. Uh, I recognize the community centers are different from corporate dentistry DSOs, but do you think that the dentistry being performed at corporate dentistry could have some of those same echoes of they're just trying to get someone something. Um, I don't know. I feel like at the beginning, we someone was talking about this idea of the consistent care. You get to either grow up with a patient, you see someone's someone, their kids, their grandkids. Do you think that's that same culture in corporate dentistry? Is there a reason why this get them in, get them out needs to happen? Is there something about that, about the population you're serving? Just trying to understand it a little better. I think that'd be a question for Roz. I don't know that one for sure. Roz. Sorry, um, can you repeat that one more time? Sorry. Oh no, I was, I was just saying is, Jordan was giving us some examples of Medicare, Medicaid patients and how 
what you do is not the dentistry you would maybe do if you had the choice, but you do it because you kind of have to, to help that population. Is there right. something that you think might be true of that in corporate dentistry that it is about the population you serve, they require something different? I, I was well, you know, a lot of corporate dentistry takes Medicaid. Okay. So they are like, the corporate office that I worked at took Medicaid and um, Medicaid only covers certain procedures. So it's really not up to you what to do. You know, mm -hmm. like it, it's not in the best interest of these patients to get metal fillings, but that's all that they can afford and that's all the insurance will give you. So you really don't have a say, you know what I mean? It's the government. This is a whole government issue. Okay. So perhaps of all three of these, thinking about, again, we're in a hypothetical world. You are a fourth year student looking for a job. Uh, we had one spiel that was about owning and operating your own office, having support from corporate. Another one that was about practicing full spectrum of dental services, variety, choice, autonomy. And the third is about serving underserved populations. Which one would be the one that would resonate with you and make you think, ah, that piques my interest? I would say the second one out of all three of them seems the best to me. Why? Um, just kind of having that autonomy. Um, I think that's a key component, especially because of corporate dentistry like you, you know, you hear about that backlash that you can get from, you know, your senior dentists or even office managers about, hey, you know, this is our business model, blah, blah, blah. But then if you have that clinical autonomy, then I feel like you're more resistant to, uh, you're more resistant to take back from what they have to say. You can treatment plan the way that you feel it's right. Okay. I agree. Um, a big thing about like patient autonomy and like provider autonomy is like, that's one of the good things about dentistry is like, it's not quite as set. Like the treatment planning is like very saturated based on insurance companies and what they'll cover, but it's not so much as, as medical field like yet. So, cause a lot of things are like fee for service and all that kind of stuff. So that is also a draw for people of why they want to do dentistry over med medical is they get to have more like provider autonomy and stuff. So okay. I think that would draw a lot of people. And also another thing about the third one is um, I don't think anyone with or the majority wouldn't think of corporate dentistry as anything like public health service related. That's just those two things like in my mind just don't correlate whatsoever. Um, and so I, I also just don't think that that is believable. I mean, they might treat it because they do, like some do accept Medicaid and Medicare and all that, what, whatever, but I don't, just in general, I would never go with probably comfort dental based on that statement. Yeah. Is that statement important to people right now? This idea of like helping people. I know Jordan, obviously you've been doing that as part of work um, in school. I mean, how much of there is that helping people, public service? Is that a part of industry at all? Um, it, yeah, it's a huge part of dentistry. There's, you know, thousands of offices across the entire US that are solely dedicated to serving the underserved. And I mean, you even get recruited to go to some where they're offering to pay off some of your student loans, um, where they're offering um, like a base salary where it doesn't matter at all uh, about how many patients you see or what procedures you do. Um, you're, you're an employee, you clock in, you clock out, and then like, that's it. Um, and some people... Uh, go into public health because they came from some of those communities and they want to give back. I think it's a very noble thing. Yep. Okay. 
Um, I have two questions from our back room. I know we're up on time. So if you absolutely need to drop, totally understand, you can do that. Um, question of mentorship that came up a couple of times. How much mentorship exists in dentistry and what are the qualities of a strong mentor in dentistry? Like you definitely, you definitely can't train somebody to be good at, at like teaching others. Mentorship is not something you can like, I don't think good mentors are like trained to be good mentors. I just think that they have genuine care and concern for like passing on their skills. Um, so I don't know. Some people are interested in telling others their, their philosophy and how they treat them and how they do things and others just want to show up at work, do their, their job, job, not interact with anybody and go home. Okay, okay, so, so maybe, maybe 50, 50 50 split, some mentors, some not. What about everyone else? Do you feel that mentorship is common in the industry? I think, I think it is just because dentistry in dental school is nothing. What you're gonna, like, it, you have to basically retrain yourself and learn everything at, once you graduate, is what I've been like, told. The way you do, like, what you use to fill a tooth and all the techniques, like, we're taught such outdated stuff at OSU that I have to relearn everything once I go, like, graduate. Interesting. Wow. I would really love to dig into that. But, okay. Um, anyone else on mentorship? You know, what, what are the qualities of a strong mentor? What, what have you learned from mentors? If you have any good examples. Um, at, least at uh, Arizona, they've started to embrace uh, the digital age. So they've hired um, dentists that embrace that early in their own practices and then decided to retire and then go teach. And they're teaching us and, you know, purchasing the equipment in order to scan and mill crowns and do same day crowns. Uh, learning the design process and everything like that. So we've had some really great mentors um, in that sense. Um, but just like Morgan said, I mean, they're still teaching us how to pack an album. And I haven't touched an album since, so I have no idea. But that goes against what Ross said, where she only used an album. So I don't know. <laughs> um. Cool. All right. Last sort of question topic, and then I'm going to free you guys. Um, we, we talked a little bit about financial motivations. I feel like Roz made it sound like there's definitely some financial motivations in corporate dentistry in general, but I'm curious what career tracks are known to be paid well and how does pay, whether immediate or long-term, how does that factor into your decision in terms of picking your path? I mean, I think, I think it also depends, depends on your personal financial, like USC dental school costs half a million dollars. So we all come out with like $543,000 of debt. Um, so you really have to take that into account. And, you know, I would love to not worry about that, but that is a concern because I don't want to be in debt for the rest of my life. Right. Okay, so pay, despite the aims we all described at the beginning of our conversation, pay does factor into it for some people. Um, do you, would you say that is foremost? It sounds like you have seen maybe it's the most because it's such a big investment. Um, Jordan, you're nodding your head. Talk I would say for my colleagues in my school, definitely for most, if okay. not all. And, and what, is, what is good pay, I guess? Is there a ballpark? Is there an explanation of, is it, is there any consistency of what is good pay versus something else? Oh, um, that it is where you live. Like for Roz, where she's living in LA, it is completely different than somebody that's living in Kansas. Fair. Okay. Whatever else, pay, that's a factor. Um, you know, how, how does being paid well affects the choices people make. Uh, my classmates are, well, we're kind of encouraged to choose a career based off of what you think people will pay. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, the audio is a little choppy for me. Is, is it happening for the girls? Sorry. 
That's okay. okay. Yeah. It's still a little robotic sounding. <laughs> you can, can type, type them into the chat. chat. How about you do that for us? And then just type that into the chat and then I'll let anyone else chat in and then we'll, we'll wrap up here because I recognize I'm keeping you over. Um, but I appreciate you typing that up for us, Celia. Um, anyone else? How you see that impacting the decisions people make, what they're slated to, perspective on what's good, hey. I think being able to cover most of your bills is probably where most people land. Um, I think it'd be like, say, a mortgage is fifteen hundred, um, loans is probably like two thousand a month, plus expenditures. So you're probably looking at like six to eight thousand um, dollars a month would be enough to cover and live comfortably um, until you get your student loans paid off. Yeah. That's probably where we're at, which would put people in like the $150,000 range before taxes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, cool. All right. Well, I'm going to free you guys, unless there's anything else you want to add about Comfort Dental, about the industry, Anything you did not get a chance to share with us that you think is important for Margaret and I, who don't know much about the industry, to know? No? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for participating. Um, I'm sure Bisma or whomever you spoke with at Fieldwork will reach out to you. Make sure you guys get paid as a thank you for your time and your perspective and opinion. Um, I know that if this is not something you do, this is a really weird thing to go into such deep topics about stuff that feels so second nature. So again, thank you so much for your time and your honesty. Um, Margaret, anything else that I missed or you want to add? I didn't give you that moment. Uh, no, I think we, I think we got it covered. Sweet. Throughout, yeah. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Want to hop on the phone and discuss? Um, if you're still around, we can invite you to the Zoom and we can all jump in and have a a, a discussion on what we did, chatted about. Um, Aubrey, I'm texting you right now. Um, or we could talk on status tomorrow about anything you would want to discuss for a follow up for next groups. And you can type into the chat on the stream with what you think is best. I'm going to stop recording, recording stopped. Um, Eric, if you want to stop the stream once we get a consensus on whether we want to chat now or set up a, a separate time that's not the middle of the night, um, we can stop that stream at that point. OK, I had just um, texted Aubrey because right as soon as you stopped, I had stopped streaming. So I don't think that she heard you when you had invited her to the Zoom. Oh, OK, cool. Um, I will. Maybe I'll just end this then and we can offer a time to regroup it tomorrow. It is already 8.30. Okay, because I had already